Hello, folks, and thank you all so much for coming out to the fifth of our weekly live Q&As in our Age of Upheaval series with Dr. Peter Harris. Over the next 20 minutes or so, Peter and I are going to be running through the excellent questions uh, that you submitted to us uh, in response to this week's fascinating deep dive into uh, the Bauhaus and Art Deco design movements of the 1920s and 30s. Um, you submitted a really interesting range of questions that, that Peter and I are very excited to dig into. So without any further ado, I'd like to ask you all to join me in giving Peter your warmest, curious minds. Welcome. Hello, Peter. How are you? I'm good, Will. Thank you. And hello out there in uh, Zoom land. Thank you for your questions and for being here. Indeed, indeed. So, Peter, I want to I want to jump right into it. Um, we've got a lot of interesting, sometimes very detailed questions about the Bauhaus and Art Deco, and you have once again gone above and beyond the call of duty and and prepared some good visual material to help us answer those. So, um, I'll I'll kick things off with um, uh, an interesting question from uh, audience member Jane Greer, who wrote in to ask. Uh, Peter, you said that the Nazis got rid of the Bauhaus movement because its aesthetic wasn't Aryan. What would Aryan design, uh, an Aryan design and aesthetic look like? Okay, uh, yes, thank you for that question, Jane. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And I'm gonna go over to, I hope, <laughs> share screen now so I can show you some uh, PowerPoint slides uh, in response to your question. Okay, uh, that working all right? Should be seeing a picture mm -hmm. there. All right, so Jane, this picture, uh, this is one I took when I was in the Bauhaus building in Dessau, standing in the office of Walter Gropius. And I asked um, the woman who was uh, letting us through into these, what about those buildings across the street? What's going on there? And she said, those were built by the Nazis during the Third Reich as a put down of the Bauhaus building directly across the street. And what makes them Nazi buildings is among other things, that sloped roof with the dormer windows. You uh, will recollect that I was harping about the uh, flat roof that the Bauhaus liked to use and the white walls and asymmetrical windows. Well, as you can see with these buildings, those windows march on in absolute symmetry up to that steep pitched roof because according to the Nazis, a pitched roof was German. Flat roofs were, and they had a, a very stern word for it, undeutsch, un-German. So there's an example right in the front yard, so to speak, of the Bauhaus. And here's another one. This was the Nazis' idea of Aryan uh, architecture, the, the long line stretching back through the medieval period with these very German half-timbered sloped roofs, dormer windows, and up in the top left of the picture, uh, you can see the, the Nuremberg Castle. And it was for this reason that the Nazis held that infamous 1934 party rally in Nuremberg, because it was such a reflection of what they were after with their uh, Aryan and rich, according to them, medieval history. This was the town of Hans Sachs. This was the, the uh, operas that Wagner made famous. So uh, this to them was what architecture should look like. Okay, uh, Peter, uh, following up on that, uh, Stephen Lyko, uh, or Lyko, I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name incorrectly, Stephen, um, wrote in with a question looking at um, the Bauhaus's influence across Europe, 
Uh, in your lecture, Peter, you mentioned that Art Deco influenced design in Europe as well as North America. And Stephen was eager to know what sort of reach uh, the Bauhaus movement had uh, and whether it spread beyond Germany and any sort of specific examples that might stand out for you. Okay, so let me move on to my next picture here. Um, this is uh, one of the few, your question is very opposite uh, because the Bauhaus influence tended to be limited mainly to Germany and I'll give a couple of reasons for that, but this is a famous building. You can see it's by Mies van der Rohe and uh, his uh, fashion designer and companion Lily Reich in 1928 in Brno, which is in Moravia, the central part of uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, so his influence, the Bauhaus influence spread there because Brno had a long tradition of German and Austrian background. It was in fact, part of the Austro-Hungarian empire. And it actually has a little opera house in it that looks just like the opera house in Vienna, only about half the size. But this is one of the few famous examples outside of Germany. France had a fellow traveler who was doing the same kind of modernist stuff that the Bauhaus was in, in um, uh, Corbusier, sorry, Le Corbusier, whose Villa Savoie looks a lot like this building and is the same date, 1928. So they, uh, he was carrying the banner in France. England was not big into Bauhaus. There was still a fair amount of anti-German sentiment lingering in England through the 20s. Uh, because of World War I. So they were not that receptive to Bauhaus styles. In fact, Walter Gropius left uh, Germany and went to England and found that his style of architecture got a fairly cool reception. So he then headed on to teach at Harvard and that exportation of the Bauhaus was a whole new story. It also ended up being quite popular in Israel, in uh, Tel Aviv, as one of the biggest areas of Bauhaus buildings, the most in the world, in fact, as lots of students from the Bauhaus fled Germany and moved to Israel. So it was a very checkered past. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peter, just a, a very related follow-up uh, we received uh, from Roseanne Partington was was asking about the recognition the Bauhaus movement received um, in its time compared to the uh, the recognition it's received in the decades and centuries since. Could you comment uh, on that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, and Roseanne, good to see your name. Uh, Will told me that there was this question from you. Uh, Will Roseanne is a survivor from a previous lecture series of mine, <laughs> and she <laughs> is also the proud owner, or was at the time, of that wonderful side uh, table um, that I showed in Eileen Gray's house, E1027. So Roseanne is uh, very much steeped in this sort of thing. So. Uh, the Bauhaus did quite well in selling wallpaper. In fact, that was its biggest selling item. And also this lamp, which I showed you was designed for that house in 1923. The wallpaper uh, was by Gunther Stolzel. And these two brought in considerable income uh, into the Bauhaus. So these were being used by uh, bought by people at a wide range of uh, income levels. But some of the fancier pieces like the Vasily chair and, and so on, not so much because they were getting more expensive. And uh, so the Bauhaus, its reach was uh, limited in some of its objects. Oh, and the other one that sold, should have thought of this, was the desk lamp that I showed you uh, from Mariana Brandt. Uh, I've got one just like it, uh, fresh out of Ikea, sitting right beside my computer here. And I'm sure some of you have examples of that too. So the Bauhaus had some influence in its sales 
and its infiltration into houses, at least in Germany and German speaking areas of Czechoslovakia. Okay, now shifting gears to Art Deco, uh, we received a couple really interesting city specific questions on the, the spread of the Art Deco aesthetic. Uh, the first question comes from Lynn Biscott, uh, who, who uh, was very intrigued to hear you mention in this week's lecture that there is an Art Deco metro station in Montreal. She wanted to ask if you could uh, give her some more information on where it's located because she's heading to Montreal the next week and would love to check it out. Hey, well, congratulations, Lynn. That's a fabulous city to visit. And that um, metro station uh, by Hector Guimard, who did all the original ones in Paris, was given to Montreal in 1966, sort of as a run-up to the Expo 67, uh, but also because French engineers were very much involved in the building of the Montreal Metro. So it is in Victoria Square, Square Victoria, uh, right at uh, Rue Saint-Antoine. So if you go to Victoria Square and Rue Saint-Antoine and right across, and, and this juxtaposition always fascinates me, it's right across from the big statue of Queen Victoria in, Queen, in <laughs> Victoria Square. So I thought, well, Hector Guimard and Queen Victoria facing it off. But yeah, so that's where you'll find it. Okay, and then for another interesting um, uh, question coming from Maxine Black, uh, who noted that one of the images in this week's closing montage was of three buildings, one under construction on the waterfront of a city, uh, but she wasn't able to place where this scene was. The buildings reminded her very much of the waterfront in her home city, Liverpool. The three buildings at the pierhead in Liverpool have um, are known by the locals uh, by the nickname the, Cre the Three Graces after Antonio Canova's famous statue, The Three Graces. Uh, so Maxine wanted to know if you could shed any light on those, uh, those images, those three buildings we saw in the closing montage. Okay, here we go. That's the uh, building that, that uh, she's talking about uh, in that montage. And this is actually, and I've got an arrow pointing at the ship there, that is a Chinese junk. So that's your big clue. This is Shanghai. And it is a picture of the Bund and that's the Yangpu River running right in front of it. But uh, I understand why you thought this maybe could be Liverpool because look at the dome and the building, the dome building here on the left, that's the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. The one with the, the uh, steeple and the clock in it, uh, that is the customs house in uh, Shanghai. And I'm gonna show you a, a juxtaposition of the harbor in Shanghai in the harbor in Liverpool, and I can totally understand your wondering whether they were one and the same. There's hmm. that picture of the Bund, and there's Liverpool Harbor, and there are, uh, as you rightly described it, the Three Graces, the liver building on the left, and you can see there's the uh, tower with the clock in it. I'm sure that was one of the things that made you think of it. And the middle building is the Kennard building and uh, the building with the dome on it uh, to the right is the uh, uh, Port of Liverpool building. So there's a clock tower and there is a dome building, but as you can see in Shanghai, they're reversed. Um, but I totally get why you thought, gee, could that be uh, Liverpool? By the way, um, Maxine, that um, Liverpool and Shanghai are twin cities. And in fact, Liverpool is rebuilding some of its harbor area uh, as of the last couple of years. And they have proposed a Shanghai tower. So that might be of interest to you. Uh, let me just show you one more picture here so you can get the, uh, you can see clearly how those two uh, clock towers uh, strike a chord, right? And uh, over, uh, let me see if I've noted that. 
Ah, let me just go back one. Over to the right in the Bund picture, it's a very popular promenade along the Yangpu River. Most of Shanghai was out there the day I had an opportunity to walk along here. It's a, it's a wonderful vista and a variety of buildings there. But this one with the green sort of triangle top is the, well, it was built originally as the Cafe Hotel and then became the Peace Hotel. And there's a picture of it and it is in uh, Art Deco style. And a few other buildings along the Bund are in Art Deco style, thanks to a British entrepreneur called Victor Sassoon. And this building is particularly famous for this. This is, according to the Guinness records, the oldest, longest live jazz band in the world. And they play in the Peace Hotel until recently anyway, when the, everything has been shuttered down. But in the 20s and 30s, Shanghai was open. So a lot of refugees from Nazi Germany ended up in Shanghai, including apparently some Jewish jazz band musicians who were among one of the groups forming this original version of the old jazz band. So when it opens up again, uh, if you can get to Shanghai, you might be able to see them in action. A fascinating uh, cross-cultural dialogue there, uh, yeah. Peter. Um, uh, amazing uh, so Peter, city. We are, indeed, indeed. So Peter, we're running out of time here, but just very quickly before we go, um, a number of audience members ran, uh, wrote in to inquire about one of the questions you were alluding to in relation to the Bauhaus, which is the degree to which both Bauhaus and Art Deco uh, decorative objects and designs were accessible to members of the general public in their time? Um, did they filter through to all strata of society or were they exclusively the realm of the wealthy? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I, I talked about that to some degree when I showed you the picture of the wallpaper and the lamp. Some of those things, smaller objects, uh, were affordable for other people, but uh, not some of the bigger ones. And um, the, the Bauhaus became pretty well known with its exhibition in 1923. And then that housing exhibit, the White Court Estate I showed in uh, Stuttgart, which was run by the, uh, the Werkbund, the German Werkbund. Um, so that introduced the Bauhaus beyond the spread of Berlin and Dessau, which was uh, sort of localized, but it did tend to be only smaller objects that got through to the, let's say, the middle and lower middle classes. Uh, whereas Art Deco, a lot of the things like the lamps and even the posters, people started collecting those posters by MUCA. And uh, so the lamps, the furnishings and so on, those spread quite widely, so I'm informed through uh, through uh, France in particular, and to some degree also in, in Germany, because it was a very interesting decorative design, whereas the Bauhaus was much more for sleek and functional. And, and I'll be touching uh, on that again, that aspect of the Bauhaus and how Art Deco morphed into something else streamlined in the last lecture. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, so that's, uh, I'm afraid, all the time we've got for today, Peter. But um, before we go, just a couple quick programming updates uh, for our friends at home. Uh, first off, uh, just a quick note that our 11.30 a.m. Uh, Q&A with uh, Dr. Laura Carlson on her Meals That Changed the World series uh, has unfortunately had to be canceled due to a family emergency she's dealing with, but we will uh, we will answer your questions via email or at next week's lecture. And then another important programming update, um, which is that next Thursday, June the 25th, we are going to be uh, unveiling the very first ever summer season of Curious Minds, including an incredibly exciting new series from the one and only Dr. Peter Harris. Um, so that's right, that's right. More Peter Harris coming your way very soon. I'll have more info for you on this great new course in the video intro that accompanies 
uh, Peter's sixth and final lecture, which will be arriving in your inboxes on Monday. So stay in tune for that. Um, we're closing this series with a real bang, uh, wouldn't you say? It's safe to say, Peter, uh, looking at essentially the moment when the roaring stopped. Yeah, sadly, yes, the roaring stopped. And um, they, uh, so we moved into the dirty 30s, quite literally, as most of the Midwest blew out <laughs> across uh, the East Coast. And we were into the Dust Bowl and then into the horrors of uh, World War II. So yeah, it's a, it's a slightly downbeat ending, but I'm hoping that I'll have the chance to pick up on some of that again with that future series. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, Peter, have a wonderful Father's Day weekend, and we look forward to keeping this great historical journey going into next week. Hey, yeah, same to you, Will, uh, and to... to uh, Zoe and Lena, they, yeah, great yes, celebration. Indeed. And thanks again, uh, all the viewers out there. I look forward to, uh, to uh, hearing from you next time. Bye for now. All right, bye for now.